Hi, this is Pat Nonis. I want to kick off by saying that we're not talking here about ideas or people who love abusing animals and seeing them suffer. That's a whole separate discussion. What's so insidious about animal welfare and ideologies like it, however, is the idea that it is possible, even desirable, to treat someone kindly or with justice before you stab them to death for a sandwich or pair of shoes. Perhaps you're not doing the stabbing. Perhaps you're just paying for it to happen, to which I would submit the element of cowardice and betrayal to animals as equal, if not worse. I made one other video in 2020 dedicated to Sam Harris in which I argued why animal rights, not welfare, is the moral baseline. Prominent scholars such as the late Tom Regan, Gary Francione, and renowned animal rights activist Gary Yorosky all hold this position. If rights are necessary for individuals with X traits, say sentience or a certain level of consciousness, then why would the same not also be true for non-human animals? In the latest episode of the Making Sense podcast titled Animal Minds and Moral Truths, Sam Harris and Peter Singer discuss issues related to animal ethics. So quite early on in the podcast, both Peter Singer and Sam Harris established that individuals with sentience or individuals who are capable of subjective experience are worthy of moral consideration at the very least. So having this baseline established, Harris presses Singer to attack or oppose the view that it is still somewhat acceptable to breed animals and kill them, given they have a good life and their death is painless. As Singer points out in the podcast, this is not the reality of 99% of farms in the United States. But even if it were, supporting the Happy Murder Club would still not be morally defensible, and I would argue an evil position to hold. Sam himself refers to animal killing as murder in episode 244 of the Making Sense podcast, titled Food, Climate, and Pandemic Risk, where he speaks with Bruce Frederick and Liz Spetz from the Good Food Institute. So if killing animals is in fact murder, it's still murder regardless of how well you treat them while they're still alive. What I find strange about this podcast is that in an earlier point of the discussion, while both Singer and Harris agree that it is often the case that the interest or a right of a human is more important than a non-human animal, depending on their level of sentience, it is also possible for animals to be morally more valuable than humans. An extremely clever chimpanzee or dolphin by this standard, has more moral importance than a person with the mind of a vegetable. So it was difficult to see how it went from the promise of the importance of the moral value of animals to grasping at straws to try and find an argument which endorses a nice or kind way to murder someone else, which I do not think is possible. In this episode, both Singer and Harris validate the standard welfare argument that goes something like this. Any animals might be justified if it can be assured that they will have good lives and are killed painlessly. It is better that animals had a good life and were murdered than no life at all. To contest this view, we need only ask Sam, would Sam find this acceptable if we replace the animals with humans of the same level of sentience? Let's assume in this hypothetical, no bad spillover effects were made into, onto society by harvesting humans and then having their flesh and limbs for lunch and dinner. I've seen Singer bite the bullet many times here. Sure, it's fine to secretly raise people until they're 18 and then kill them painlessly, given that there are no spillover effects, bad effects to society. Then at least you're being consistent. If Sam is really committed to the animal welfare view as opposed to animal rights, I think he should be more explicit about it so his audience knows just where he stands with regards to what he finds, what, to what he finds morally acceptable to do to people and animals who are weaker, less intelligent, or less capable. My intuition, and I could be wrong here, is that he would not be willing to bite the bullet like how Singer does, which is why I think he should provide an argument or name the trait as to why he would not find it acceptable to breed and kill humans painlessly. This argument is known as name the trait, or NTT, popularized by Isaac Brown from the YouTube channel Ask Yourself. Basically, the challenge is to put forward or to name the trait true of an animal that, if true of a person, would justify stabbing them to death for a sandwich. Isaac actually asked Sam this very question and received an inadequate response. Or, alternatively... Sam can remain consistent with his values of justice and compassion and simply be vegan and hold the animal rights view. That is, no one, human or animal, is exploited by anyone else or should be exploited by anyone else because an entailment of individuals with moral value is that they ought to have moral and legal rights. There's a good reason people feel so repulsed when fanatics try and argue Hamas treated their hostages well. They were so kind, they helped grandma and the little girl to the car. There are stories of Nazi SS officers in concentration camps telling the officers to kill children in a more decent way. If there is some kind of significant difference in the moral value between a child and a non-human animal, or a non-human animal and a disabled person, and I'm talking about a significant moral difference, not some bullshit social contract theory rationale, I would like to hear it.
So Sam uses this term both in the blurb of the podcast and during the podcast as well, conscientious omnivores, which similar to my critique on welfare is an oxymoron. Can you be a conscientious terrorist? Can you have a conscientious holocaust? Can you conscientiously murder someone who probably does not want to die? Because even in the nicest, happiest farm in the world, those animals are still getting their throats slit and they're still getting stabbed to death. If you're drinking milk, they're getting raped as mammals only lactate when they're pregnant. Their babies are still getting taken away from them. He's right, by the way, when he says in this podcast that animals do probably, some animals, domesticated animals or even in farms, do probably have better lives than in nature. As I've discussed in my previous videos, nature acts tyrannically against animals and I would support the domestication of all wild animals. The solution isn't, however, to breed them nicely and eat them. The solution, if we're anywhere close to being a decent species, is to help them, animals, attain rights in society and be protected from harm, whether it's natural or man-made. And ideally, the long-term goal, I would like to see not just rights for animals, but rights for all humans and animals and the flourishing of all species. So I think a lot of the problems are stemming from the normative ethic of utilitarianism. I ask that you bear with me while I get through some of these denser philosophical issues because I think it's ultimately what motivates people who want to believe in this illusion of animal welfare. So I want to note here quickly that I've heard Sam at different times say that he's a utilitarian and at other times more consequentialist. I'm not sure what he currently is, but for the purposes of this video, I'm focusing on his utilitarian inclinations here. So being a threshold or moderate deontologist myself, I think rights should almost always have priority over anything else unless there are extremely good reasons for the rights violation. As far as I know, there is next to nothing which justifies the rights violation of most animals on Earth. So keep in mind that a threshold deontologist normative ethic is going to, under, it's going to be the value that underpins most of this video and its critique. So if you're a utilitarian, ultimately all you're going to be concerned with is utility. If you're a classical utilitarian, you're concerned with maximizing utility, sometimes called maximizing well-being or happiness. If you're, if you're a negative utilitarian, you're interested in reducing suffering. If you want my personal view on this particular normative ethic, in addition to producing some of the most unhinged views I've seen, I mean, I just find it so basic, like maximizing happiness, reducing suffering. Happiness and suffering are important, crucial aspects of one's life, but there are also different tools we need, such as rights, to even secure something like well-being in the first place. If you're not a utilitarian, say you're a deontologist, a consequentialist, a virtue ethicist, there are things outside experience or utility that can matter. And I think the flexibility of this dynamic often leads to more fair and just evaluations of individuals and situations. What is particularly irritating is when people don't even know what normative ethics is or what their normative ethics is, and they're kind of just arguing without even knowing what values are on the table. So pursuant to utilitarianism, it is actually okay to raise someone, make sure they have a good life and kill them painlessly because all that matters is that you maximize their utility or well-being while they're still alive. And you can take that away as well if you do it painlessly. This is consistent with utilitarianism. And this isn't really the first time I felt utilitarianism has confused some of Sam's views or morals. Here's another recent example. On his Waking Up Meditation app, which I'm an avid user of, he gives an account of the story, The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas a 1973 short work of philosophical fiction by American writer Ursula K. Le Guin. So it's basically about this city called Omelas. Omelas is a city of pure joy and happiness, like paradise with no fear, crime or suffering. Kind of like what heaven would be like if it were written by a combination of Christians singing Christmas carols and a Disney PG-13 movie, pre-work era. But this utopian city and its prosperity depends on the perpetual misery of a single child. The child is basically living in their own shit, constant agony, basically just the worst life imaginable. Every single person living in the city knows this, and it's only a few who choose to walk away. So Sam's take on this story is that the world, the city in this story, is infinitely better than our current world, given millions of children suffer, not just one, for the comfort and happiness of others. He therefore calls this segment a moral illusion. So now, my personal understanding of the story was not that it was meant to be making a comment on whether or not the city of Omelas was worse or better than our world. And I agree with Harris in many ways. It's a better world than our current world, simply because of the numbers. You know, one child suffering is not as bad as a million children suffering. But the actual point of the story is not to make that comparison. The point of the story is basically a reductio on utilitarianism. It's a tool which is meant to ascertain or challenge the values of the reader. Is it okay for one person to be in eternal misery so many others can be eternally happy? 
If your moral intuition on this is no and gets you thinking about other options, for example, can the misery be shared? Can the child be liberated? You must reject classical or hedonistic utilitarianism. That's the whole point of the reductio. So I'm not sure if he's willingly ignoring what I see as the main purpose of that story. It's a tool rather than a real world comparison or, you know, any kind of comparison or misinterpreting it. But again, I've seen him kind of dodge addressing utilitarian reductios. I can't remember the episode and please comment if you know what I'm talking about. But in another podcast, Harris and his guests talk about the experience machine. This is another time I felt Harris did not engage properly with the utilitarian reductio. The experience machine was a thought experiment crafted by Robert Nozick and is one of the best known attempts to refute classical utilitarianism. Okay, so here's the deal. You have a choice between everyday reality and a simulated reality. The simulated reality or experience machine is one where you're going to experience joy beyond your wildest dreams. If you choose to plug in, fine, you're a certified beyond help utilitarian. Um, Good to go, harvest humans, as long as they kill painlessly, etc. However, if you choose your reality over the happiness machine, basically you're saying that there are things outside experience that matters. And if you admit that, then you can't really commit to utilitarianism because it's a normative ethic which holds utility or experience has the value which matters. So from memory, when asked if he, Sam, would plug into the machine, Sam did not really take a strong view either way. So I have to question the extent, I guess, of his utilitarianism, assuming that's the normative ethic he's most into. Keep in mind, I'm not saying someone's framework has to cover every single ethical dilemma in existence. I just feel... Like when I compare him to Peter Singer, Singer explicitly and always commits to the crazy utility train, whereas Sam hesitates, dodges, or otherwise does not really engage with the main purpose of the reductio. I think this is ultimately why I find Sam more frustrating than Singer, but at the same time more worth the time in trying to persuade otherwise. I think Singer is 100% committed to utilitarian or consequentialist thinking. Like he'll bite the bullet on so much insane stuff I don't think Sam would. A lot of the time, maybe deep down, Sam knows that this humane murder shit is wrong and is experiencing some kind of severe cognitive dissonance. For me, Singer acts as someone who really believes the things he says. Sam more acts like a guilt-ridden meat eater who is looking for an excuse. And it's my intuition that this reluctance originates from maybe like a subconscious intuition that he may or may not have, which I think is morally correct if he does have it, that some of these views are just kind of crazy and morally volatile. For me, it's simple. There are things outside felt experiences that matter, and that thing is the concept of rights. If you're in a loving marriage for all your life, but your partner is secretly cheating on you, there's something wrong with this, whether or not you find out. If someone rapes you without you knowing and you never suffer from it, this is still a serious rights violation. If non-human animals are treated nicely but murdered for someone's burger, this is a rights violation. I can see the value of utility and well-being, but to have that has a base value and it has The only thing that matters seems to ultimately lead to unhinged, insane, and I would argue evil outcomes. So this whole humane murder is better than factory farming argument also engages in the false dilemma fallacy or the false dichotomy fallacy. So this is where someone presents a limited number of options, but there's actually more options. So it's not just let's murder animals kindly instead of holocausting them. There is also the option of being vegan. And hopefully one day it won't be an option. Animal rights will just be off the shelf in our legal system. And you'll be forced to be vegan. You should absolutely be forced to be vegan in the same way cannibals, rapists, and pedophiles are forced by society and the law to not harm their would-be victims. Sam also mentions in the podcast a quote which I quite like when defending his rather weak argument for animal eating. He says that the pure is the enemy of the good. This can be true in many situations. But the situation of animals is not one of them. Veganism and fighting for animal rights is not pure in the same way it wouldn't be pure to fight against rape or against the Holocaust, or against Hamas. I mean, is it pure? Are you being the enemy of the good when you want to abolish Hamas as opposed to just regulate them? If something is that evil and causing that much harm to people, and by people I also mean animals, I've always just called animals people since I was little. My sister and I have just always done that. I think it should be not considered pure to want to abolish that thing. Finally, has mentioned, I'm a moderate deontologist. So that's my closest uh, approximation in terms of normative ethics. But my second close approximation would actually be virtue ethics. As I've discussed elsewhere, virtue ethics, as corny as it sounds, is concerned with being all you can be, basically, like being the best you can be. It kind of makes a claim that there's a certain disposition in a person that wants them to be the absolute best that they can possibly be in every single way, but especially morally and intellectually. It's greatly linked to this idea of individual and collective flourishing. But what are the chances you're going to reach human flourishing if you're stuffing your face with murdered animals? That seems like It would be very counterintuitive 
to anyone interested in moral and intellectual flourishing. There are some things I really enjoyed about this podcast. Sam acknowledges animals can be more valuable than humans, for example. Smart and sentient animals are more valuable than less sentient or smart pe- or less smart people, or just evil people in general. I like that Singer pushed back on Sam's argument to treat humans as more valuable than animals, even if they're not, for policy reasons. Singer's quick response was, you would be doing so at the expense of animals, which is not justified. Kind of like, why should I believe that? I thought it was a good point, and it's just, why don't we come up with a policy that helps both of them, <laughs> not just humans? Uh, There's no reason why we should only be helping humans and actually there's probably more reasons why animals need more help uh, and better policies. I thought it was great that Singer and Harris managed to move quite smoothly through the philosophical topics and not get too bogged down in trivial points. Um, I felt like that kind of happened when Sam podcasted with Martha Nussbaum. They spent, I don't know, something like half an hour debating on whether you would save a human over an animal. And After a while, I think this has been in the space for quite some time, it just kind of gets old. The discussion Sam and Peter had about animal experimentation I thought was very powerful and I hope to hear more like it. So if you think this is an important message for Sam, please tag him on his social media. I just want Sam and people like Sam to know that there's a better way than just the utility approach all the time, especially for problems that can essentially be solved with rights. All right, peace out, bitches.